Hi everyone, today I have three wonderful guests on my channel to talk about one of my favorite books of all time. It's also one of my guests' favorite book of all time. I bet you can guess who that is. And so here joining me today, I have Sarah from Sarah Reads. Sarah, welcome to the channel. Thank you, Joan. I'm really excited to discuss Dune with you. I've been looking forward to it for a long time. Yes, I'm so excited to hear Sarah's thoughts. I actually just watched your video this morning. I meant to tell you about that but I'm excited to get into this too. Um, this was Sarah's first time reading Dune. It was my second time reading Dune. And next we'll go to my next new guest to the channel, which is Mike from Mike's Book Reviews. So hi, Mike. Hi there. This is my 13th time to read Dune. And that is not, <laughs> that is not a fake number. That is actually the truth. Feeling a little under the weather, but I decided I'm just gonna go ahead and put on my still suit and come on because I can always talk about Dune. So thank you for having me. Well, thank you for being here. And I would love to hear from anyone in the comments. If there is anyone in who is watching this video who has read Dune 13 times or more, more <laughs> times than Mike, I would love to hear from you. Please let me know. And also joining us is returning guest to my channel, Philip Chase. Hey, Philip. Hi, Joanna. Thank you so much for, for having me back. I, I guess I, I, I behaved well enough the, the last couple of times that you don't mind me coming back. So that's good. <laughs> You did. And this is your second time reading Dune as well, right? It is. But the first time was like 30 years ago or something. So, um, yeah. So I was due for a reread for sure. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I'm so glad that I did that so that I could join you guys today. Yeah. Wonderful. And we're going to start off just a little bit of non-spoiler and then, of course, go into spoilers for this discussion. And it's interesting now that, you know, Philip mentioned that it's been a while since he read it the first time. It's been about nine years since I read Dune, and it definitely, I loved it this time, just as much as last time. I, I loved the book. I remember when I finished reading Dune the first time, that was actually the first real sci-fi book I've ever read, with the exception of like Frankenstein. If you want to count Frankenstein as a sci-fi book, <laughs> then this is like the second sci-fi book I've ever read, I think. But I remember it was very impactful for me. I finished the book and I felt a little weird saying this because I had never read sci-fi before, but I remember thinking, this is the best book I've ever read, I think possibly. Um, so we could talk about that, about our experience as a first time reader of Dune in Sarah's case, as a second time reader of Dune in the case of me and Philip, and a 13th time reader of <laughs> Dune <laughs> in the case of Mike here and talk first of all, like why you should read Dune. So Sarah, I first would love to hear from you since this was your very first time reading Dune and you had a wonderful discussion on your channel about how many of your fears of this book were unfounded. And I could definitely relate to that because I felt the same way after I read it the first time. Definitely. So I, I am definitely not as well read in the realm of science fiction as I am in fantasy. And I do find that sometimes I struggle with science fiction. It really depends. It, it varies from book to book, but a lot of that really dense technological jargon, a lot of those really complex scientific theories and you know processes that happen in some of the old and new science fiction books that I read, I find myself feeling a little bit lost. And I feel like sometimes in science fiction, I get the sensation that I'm a little bit removed from the characters because it's more about the theme. It's more about the ideas. It's more about how that technology has impacted our lives. And so for a long time, I looked at Dune, which was this massive, you know, chunky sci-fi work of science fiction. And I thought that I would feel the same. I knew that it was a little bit older. So I worried about the writing style being dense. There were a lot of things that really held me back from reading it. And so after I had finished, that was one of the things that I wanted to talk about is why I was totally wrong about so many of those things. And I think one of the reasons for that is that Dune focuses much less on that technological aspect that a lot of science fiction focuses on and gives us more of an intimate story. Now, don't get me wrong. It is very far reaching. There's a lot of political maneuvering that's happening. This is a grand story in terms of scope and idea, but it, it is not difficult or it wasn't difficult for me in the same way as some of that really dense science fiction, because I think it had a lot to say about some really fundamental 
parts of humanity. So about leadership, about the environment, about heroism, about how we treat others and how we relate to other people in the world around us. So once I started, I got totally sucked up in all of that exploration of theme and it ended up being a lot less intimidating than I thought it would be. And it was I found it at least to be really compelling. I could not stop reading it. I even started reading it early. It was supposed to be a book that I read in September. And I thought, well, I have this discussion in, you know, at this time in September. And what if I don't finish it? What if everybody else has already read it and I don't get through it or I struggle? And I read it in a couple of days. Like I was finished by the time September even came because it was so good. It just kept pulling me in the whole way. And I found it to be so so interesting, but also it did not feel like a book that was written in 1965. This feels very modern in terms of what it explores and how it is written, how it's presented. So I think if you are like me and you're someone who is used to reading a lot of fantasy with a big cast of characters and maybe some new terms that you need to pick up on, I don't think that there's going to be anything in Dune that should hold you back from reading it. And for me, at least it was a definite five-star experience. I really, really loved it. Wonderful. Thank you for saying that. I felt the same way when I first read June and you brought up so many different elements in the book, which is why I think I'm excited to get to Philip and Mike's opinions, because this is definitely a book I could, even though this is only my second time having read June, I could easily see myself rereading it several more times and getting different layers of the story, looking at it through different types of lenses. And even though it is very broad in scope, as you mentioned, and touches on all these different themes, which we can get into, I love that at the heart of this story, there's also a family. And Mm -hmm. we do get deep into those characters too. Um, So from here, let's go next to Philip. How was this for you 30 years later? Well, I have to say that I can see why this is Mike's favorite book of all time. And I... I was astounded just to pick up on one point that Sarah made, how well this book has aged since it was written is, is really quite amazing. I, I think that's probably a testament to some degree uh, about how influential Dune has been. A lot of people have been influenced by Dune and the fact that it reads is so fresh. There, there are a few quirks that I'll talk about later that, that do kind of show that it was written in the 60s. But I mean, it's, it's amazing how few they are. And as I was saying, I think it's been such an influential book and deservedly so. You know, for example, uh, I think all of us here except Sarah have been reading the Malazan books and uh, hopefully Sarah will someday. I will. <laughs> yeah. Um, actually, I'm, I'm excited to have Sarah read Malazan for lots of reasons, but but we'll talk about that later. Um, but I, I can see where, and, and this is well known that Steven Erickson was very influenced by Dune. And I, I'm, as I'm reading Dune, I'm thinking, oh, wow. Yeah, I see it. I get it. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Um, and that's a series that all, you all know that I love. Um, I consider the Malazan books as a whole to be the, the greatest, my personal favorite in, in, in the genre of fantasy. So, so, but I can see where Dune is such an important book. And also it's just a great, great story. I, I was so moved. It ticks all the boxes for me. It's got some really great thematic depth to it and themes that I just, I love personally, for example, this, this sense of, um, the sense of connection to, uh, and it's, it has to do a lot with the ecological aspects of it um, and, and the whole desert setting and the fact that, that uh, life is at a very, it's starkest in a setting like a, a desert, right? It puts things in, in an extreme in a way that brings out, I think some really cool things. So I really appreciate that. And so, yeah, this sense of connection, the, that life is all connected, that people are all connected and the, uh, that, that aspects of, of people that we love and hate are also within us. And it's just really mind blowing at times how, how well Frank Herbert was able to get that across in here. But it has all those emotional moments for me too. I, I found myself, <laughs> I don't know, maybe I'm getting more and more sentimental as I get older, but I, I was, I was, 
crying at times during this read. Um, and I had read the story before and I, I didn't remember every detail, but I remembered the major events and it still got me in, in a way that uh, great books will get you. Um, so just works for me on so many levels. And um, it's, it's a brilliant, brilliant book. Um, definitely my, my, uh, the, the deservedly one of the most revered books in, in science fiction and, and probably I can say without a doubt, my favorite science fiction, uh, science fiction book ever, although I'm not extremely well read in the genre either. So, but uh, brilliant stuff. Yeah, that was so beautifully said about connection beautifully mm -hmm. said. And I agree with you. I'm eager for Sarah to read Molazin. And actually it's funny because when I was watching your Dune review, Sarah, and you were talking about how so many of your fears and intimidations of Dune were unfounded, I was like thinking she's going to make the same kind of video about Gardens of the Moon. <laughs> I can already see it. Um, anyway, back now, <laughs> not a mic. Mike, I'm please my tell pistol us. now. All right. <laughs> Tell us about your 13th reread of Dune and what makes this so special. I'm so excited to hear uh, more of your thoughts on this. First, I'll say as much as I love hearing yours and, and Philip's thought, hearing how much Sarah got out of this in her first read makes me feel like maybe I was just a simpleton the first time I read it because she pulled so much out of that mm -hmm. that I didn't in my first read. And I wish I could. But as Frank Herbert said, if wishes were fishes, we'd all cast nets, right? So for me, I think what this story is, I read it for the first time when I was like 14 because I remember my dad and my brother watching the movie at the time. I was like, I wanted Star Wars, and it wasn't Star Wars, you know. So I fell asleep in that movie. And regardless of how you feel about that movie, it's. Hmm. Uh, but <laughs> I so I tried reading it, and I just like this is this is pretentious garbage. I can't stand this. I put it down. I tried reading it again because I was just like, this is this is like so many people's favorite book. I feel like I, am, I I'm not smart enough for something. So I tried reading it again at 15. Finished it that time. And I was like, I, I hated it. I couldn't stand it. And then I started like a couple months later, I was like, why am I still thinking about this? Did, did I actually love the book? And then I read it again and it felt like the third eye open. And I just, I understood everything. And it just meant so much. And it just, um, it, it sounds hyper hyperbolic to some people when I say it's a book that changed my life. Cause it's the way that I viewed lots of things. I struggled with, you know, confidence, self-esteem, all that stuff. And I very much was able to relate to Paul very much in, in that, in that reading. And it's just a lot of things I, I really just latched onto. And I kind of used in my everyday life, even now very much so. And uh, I don't know, I think that everybody has like that one book for them that will do that. And uh, I have several books. I, I think I, I, I take a lot from and have inspiration for, but this is the one that without a doubt, I look at a lot of the decisions that I made in my life. And I think a lot of that came from the teachings of Frank Herbert. And yes, I will call them teachings of Frank Herbert because uh, the man was very, very ahead of his time, as you guys say. Yes, there are a couple of things. You'd be like, ah, it's not, that might not have dated the best. But as I'm reading it, I'm just like, a lot of these ideas that he put in here were like, you got to think about when this came out in the 60s, a lot of this stuff was considered very progressive at the time, for sure. Uh, especially with like the Ben and Gesserit and stuff. Really, really great stuff that just... Uh, kind of what you said that Philip that you can get some different out of it every single time you read it I think with me this time uh, reading it this time is kind of the non-spoilery kind of things but basically how we would look at our parents is like you know almost like superhuman figures and, and to see Paul realizing that his father is just a man that part really got me right here you know as a as a, as a parent of of young kids now and just thinking wow you probably think you're like this this big silly loser to your kids and they probably think you're just like this superhero you know so uh, yeah, again, every time I read it, uh, people, why would you read a book that many times? I really do believe that you can get something different out of this every time you read it. And I think Sarah pulled about seven or eight of them there. So, uh, so and the second time you read it, you're going to pull even more. It's going to be great. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I imagine that's definitely going to be the case for me every time I pick this up. And I'm curious, Mike, uh, do you find, so you said that when you read it when you were younger, you identified more with Paul. Did you find reading it now at this stage in your life that you identified with some of the older characters uh, a lot of a lot of duke leto yeah for sure uh i, I can see a, a little bit of, of of life experiences through through several of these characters uh, not named harkonnen but uh <laughs> yeah there's 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 several things i could see in there and be like yeah i could i could see that decision but much clearer now than i could as a teenager for sure yeah yeah so anything else we can say in a non-spoiler non-spoiler way about dune i know that uh that you, Philip, mentioned a little bit about the writing style and how there were certain elements that gave it away that it was written at the time it was written. I don't know if that gets, gets into any spoilers, but... Um, no, I, yeah, I think we can talk about that in a non-spoiler way for sure. So 
to me, and and maybe Mike and and Sarah would, or even yourself, you might disagree. Um, but a couple things that did feel a little aged in a way. Um, one would be, and this is um, this is a fairly common thing, I think. So the the, the book takes a a uh, an omniscient narrator uh, has an omniscient narrator. And we get the thoughts of lots of characters. And I think these days we're more used to a limited omniscient narrator. In other words, a, a, an omniscient narrator who primarily presents things from one character's perspective, what we call a POV character. So what happens in every chapter of Dune is the POV switches very abruptly. And so that's the omniscient narrator is ba basically able to tell us the thoughts of every single character in a scene and, and will do so. Um, so that, that might be a little bit of an adjustment for people who are used to a limited omniscient narrator who where you would have just one character's thoughts during a chapter or a segment of a chapter. So that's one thing where I think you, you tend to see authors avoiding that omniscience these days, more or less. Um, another thing that shows its age maybe, and, and I, this is something I don't mind at all actually, but um, you, I think a lot of more modern science fiction and fantasy probably is a bit more visceral. We'll go and describe a, 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 a scene of carnage in more detail. Whereas in Dune, you, you tend to have things happen off camera, so to speak. Um, so, but, but tragic things that affect you nonetheless. So that might, that might, affect pacing for some readers. Um, this might be a little more introspective than, than what modern readers of, of genre fiction are used to because they're used to kind of more action, 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 you know, right in front of them all the time. So that might be another sort of thing. And I don't know how Mike and, and Sarah and you would think of those things, but those are just a couple things where, and, and you get used to it right away. For me, it was not, a, a, these were non-issues, but I think they do show a, a, the age of, of uh, Dune a little bit there. I think yeah. it's very, very uh, Tolkien in that way and where he can spend three pages describing a, a hill to you. And then it's like, oh, there's three sentences. The battle's over. It's like, you know, so, yeah, yeah, I could definitely see some of that. With me, the bigger one would be I hear a lot of people saying like, oh, I don't like the way that Leto talks to Lady Jessica in some parts. And I'm like, we can get into it more in spoilers, but you got to understand, guys, she let that happen. She could have stopped that immediately if she had wanted to. She just loves the character so much. So that that's something that I think might be hard for some modern readers to to accept. But the more you go into the series, the more you learn about the Bene Gesserit, you feel like, no, it's it's not happening the way that you're thinking it's happening. So, Yeah, that actually speaks to some things I actually really love about this book, but we'll get into that. Um, and yeah, that is something that I have heard uh, a couple of people talk about, too, is that I know that I don't really, it doesn't really matter to me whether people classify this as sci-fi or sci-fantasy you know that full <laughs> we don't have to get into that debate. This discussion <laughs> i tell people all the time it is science fiction for fantasy fans looking to make the jump if it's got interstellar travel and spaceships i'm always going to call it science fiction but i can also say if you love a song of ice and fire if you love wheel of time i don't see you having a hard time jumping to this because both of those stories were very very influenced by this it is very very clear especially when you look at Benny Jesser at Aes Sedai, you look at Fremen, the IEO, it's very hard not to see these things at all yeah. with some of those things. And then your great house is with a song of ice and fire, which is just a traditional fantasy trope at this point. But uh, yeah, I can see that. It's definitely a great gateway for people who love fantasy, but I will always stump for it being science fiction. It's called the best selling science fiction book of all time, not the best <laughs> sci fantasy book of all time. So there. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I was just getting into that because there is a feudal system and women, mm -hmm in this world, um, well, we can get into what the Bene Gesserit are about, uh, but in general, I know that there, I mean, this is a system that does have concubines and there is some criticism, I think, of the way women are portrayed in this world, uh, but we can get into that too in more detail in the spoiler section for sure. But I would say overall, the, uh, this is definitely not a book I would be intimidated by. It is something I think you notice right away, like what Philip was talking about, where you're in one character's thoughts and then like two paragraphs later, you're in a different character's thoughts. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was interesting because honestly, I don't think I've ever read a book like that before. So I didn't even, maybe I have and don't remember, but um, I didn't realize that was something that was more common, I guess, at one point. 
yeah. in maybe the 60s or so. Yeah. So that was that was interesting. But overall, I think that I don't know. Is it wrong to say this? I think the prose is pretty accessible. Uh, yeah. I mean, you read More this. More so than Lovecraft or Tolkien, I think for sure. Yeah. Or Robert e. Howard, definitely. Yeah, I think so too. Great. And um, is there anything else non-spoiler we want to say before getting into spoilers? I didn't say about uh, why you should read. I always tell yeah. people I don't necessarily. Usually when I tell people why you should read something, I feel like it's going to be a people pleaser. Uh, I don't think that this is a book that everyone's going to love. It really depends on you. Uh, I tell people all the time, it kind of depends on where you're at in your life, because some people be like, I read it when I was 20 and I hated it. I tried it again when I was 30 and I loved it. And it's just, I think it just depends on where you're at in your life. It just, it just hit me at the right time. I think that's why it cl clicked with me so well. So yeah. don't feel bad if you, I get lots of people being like, man, I tried. I just can't, I just can't get into it like you did. <laughs> It, I don't I expect more people to say they don't like it than they like it, honestly. So I'm excited. There's so many people reading it for the first time that are really enjoying it. So. Yeah. 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 Great. All right. Well, I guess from here, we can go ahead and go into spoilers. So spoiler section here. And I guess from here, yeah, I, I, I guess what I could say spoiler wise is that, like I said, I read this about nine years ago. And I think at the time it just... For me, I, this might sound weird or silly, I don't know, but I remember thinking, wow, Jessica is like the person I want to be, and Paul is the son I want to have, and Leto is the man I want to be with, or whatever. <laughs> um, and now, looking at it uh, nine years from now, I definitely still admire these characters so much. In fact, I think, but I do see some things a little bit differently. I think that Paul's arc to me is absolutely fascinating. It's absolutely fascinating. And it's interesting too about Jessica's arc. And when I look at the two, when I was kind of thinking back on the book, it felt to me almost as though, I still admire Jessica. I think she's still a very admirable character in a lot of ways. And um, I can get in, give, you, give some examples of that, but before doing so, I'll just go ahead and say in a general way, what I found interesting is that it seemed to me as though at the beginning of the book, Paul starts off as a child. He seems very much a child and Jessica seems very strong. She has kind of like a quiet dignity about her, but she's a very strong character. And I feel like over the book, you see Paul get stronger and stronger. And yes. uh, Jessica almost kind of, maybe not so much, almost kind of weakens, I would say. I don't know if that's the right word, weakens, but she changes and she just seems to go more into herself. That was my perception anyway. And then of course, it's also heartbreaking because I think you know that Leto is going to die. <laughs> you know, he's gonna be betrayed. And like, there is a part of me, I think both when I read it the first time and the second time where I just wanted to resist that like crazy. I didn't want it to happen. I didn't want it to be real. I kept, I was like in denial about it <laughs> until it happened. So that's about that. Who wants to go first? <laughs> My kids just got home and they're trying to whisper. I don't know if you've ever heard a six and seven year old try to whisper, but it's <laughs> not a whisper. So I'll let you guys go first while their dad gets them into another activity and then I'll jump in after. Uh, okay. Um, nope. if it, sorry, I said a lot. So if you all want to just start on one yeah, character, yeah. it's up to you. I don't know. I just was giving some overall perceptions on characters. Well, I, I had some thoughts too that are, a bit, I mean, just, I, I wanted to react to what you said first um, and about Jessica and her. And I think um, Mike mentioned this already, the idea of, of parents and, and, ch and children, the relationship between parents and children. And mm -hmm. there was a moment in the, in the book where um, Paul had this realization that part of growing up means that there is the realization that you cannot be you cannot have that same level of intimacy that exists between your parents that you are something that is outside of this unit of of your parents mm -hmm. so that was a, a kind of a cool coming of age moment and it was um it, it was part of the the, the little bit of handing over the torch sort of thing although i would say jessica 
comes into her own power as well, doesn't she? I mean, she has her own very interesting arc here. Um, and and the, the role that she ends up embracing among the, now is, is somebody help me, because I've never heard these pronounced, but is it Freeman or Fremen? Fremen. Fremen, okay. Oh, I've been pronouncing so, it wrong in my head. <laughs> I mean, like I tell everybody, it doesn't matter. As long as you're reading it, I don't think the author would care if you're saying yeah. it or not. Okay. But uh, what what she embraces among them um, is, is really, um, I think, something that she also, to a degree, establishes for herself. Although it's so interesting because the, the Bene Gesserit or Gesserit, whatever. <laughs> Gesserit, okay. I'm going with Mike's pronunciation. Uh, the Bene, because you read it 13 times, man. Yeah. Um, so Bene Gesserit, uh, the fact that they have sowed the seeds of, of these prophecies on these various planets and stuff and manipulated people and it's stuff like that. So she's, she's been able to benefit from that and is smart enough to use that to assume her own role. So I, I think it's pretty cool uh, how she empowers herself. Um, and that, that also is, is very relevant to the whole chosen one trope in, that you see in this. Paul is a big chosen one in a big way, which is another reason why some people probably feel like it's sort of fantasy-like, although I'm not gonna argue with Mike on that. Um, but, um, you know, it, there that chosen one trope is huge in, in Dune, but I love what Frank Herbert does. He, he has it be a result of these, these uh, prophecies that the Bene Gesserit have seeded all over the universe in order to serve their own agenda. So it's, it's, it takes a little bit of the, the mystery out of the prophecy. In other words, the people are, are um, well, as they say, self-fulfilling prophecy in a way, right? I mean, you, you, you invent the prophecy first and then you do enough little things to, to sort of conform to it. Um, and then people think, oh, wow, the prophecy is fulfilled here. So I, I kind of like what Herbert does with that and whether or not Paul is actually the fruit of some ancient prophecy or if he's just taking advantage of the prophecies is, is sort of, I think, a question that's open for debate. But, but Jessica certainly consciously uses the prophecies that have been seeded by her order. So I think well, that, that's pretty yeah. cool. Yeah, and I'll just add, I do admire that character still. Um, yeah. In fact, I, one of the things I admire the most about Jessica is there is a scene actually at the beginning of the book where she is talking to UA and she knows that he is hiding something from her. And he asks her something along the lines of why don't you just manipulate Leto into marrying you? And she says for a couple of reasons. One is that there is political power in the idea of him not having me as a wife because then other houses can vie for power, I guess, by possibly marrying into his house or whatever. But also the second reason is that I don't believe in manipulating somebody into or coercing somebody to make a decision like that. You have to, like she believes in, you know, trust and faith in that sense. And that was so beautifully said, the way she said that was, I just, I even remember that nine years ago. I remember like just loving that passage, but also loving the subtext behind it too, because she's also telling Yue and herself that she wants to trust him. She wants to trust Yue. Then she even ends the chapter by telling herself, I want to trust my friends. And so there she's on this, I, I kind of see her as even though she has all of these skills and she's able to manipulate, she chooses not to use those skills for a long time. And then there's this fantastic moment towards the end of the book where she realizes suddenly that she's been kind of in her own way trying to manipulate Paul's path and of course I mean that's kind of the goal right that was sort of what she wanted to do um, but then she realizes she doesn't want to do that and she removes herself from that and says marry Chani if you want to marry Chani she tries to take herself out of that and I loved that too and I even with the Bene Gesserit stuff aside, and I am not, I'm not a mother. I think I'm the only one of the four of us who is not a parent, but I can, one thing I would imagine, and you can all tell me if I'm wrong because I'm not a parent, but I would imagine that having a child, you want the best for your child and you want wonderful things for your child. And you do want them to have choice and everything, but it would probably be so hard to let go of trying to hold on to the reins of your child. Um, so I just thought it took incredible strength for her to do that, both with Leto 
in the beginning and also with Paul at the end. And it was something that made me admire her character so much. And just speaking of larger philosophical themes, I think it just is a philosophical theme that really resonated with me the first time I read the book and the second time about how just because I believe in something doesn't mean I want to force other people to feel the way I feel. I would rather them come, in, come from their own inner decision-making to arrive at the same truths as me, not for me to force people, my truths on other people. So that was just something about her character I deeply admired. Yeah. And hey, we all do have a vision for our children. And one of the hardest things you can do is to let go of that vision and allow your child to forge their own path. Mine are still young, so I don't have to listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> well, the mission or protectiva is something we kind of adapted to my household where they basically have like this myth that we instilled in my first kid of, oh, don't make dad mad because that's when the real punishment happens. <laughs> now that the youngest is starting to get like sick, they're, they're starting to realize that that's a big bluff. Mm. So that, 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 that propaganda is starting to fail. I have a, a couple of things about this. I argue still to this day that Jessica is the main character of this book. Because you look at everything she's like, there's, let me tell you the specific part that people in my Discord were upset about was when she was trying to hang up that picture of, of, of Leto's father. And he's basically like, no, I'm putting my foot down. And they're like, how could he talk to her that way, whatever? You think she could have used the voice and made him do whatever the hell she wanted? But she loved the guy so much. I mean, that's why she betrayed her order to give him a son instead of the daughter. Like he, she was ordered to do that. They have been doing this breeding program for centuries. And she just blew it, right? They could have had, they could have lost the whole thing. So uh, she never listens to what anybody tells her in this book. She's always doing what she wants to do. She may not look like it on the page, but when you read between the lines, you see, like, look at Thu for Howitt, the baddest ass mentat in the galaxy, right? And he's terrified of her. He's terrified to be alone with her. You know, when you when they meet the, the Fremen, they're like, holy shit, this, this weirding way is amazing. Can you please teach us? They're doing whatever she wants. So I think every single time that she has a situation, a story where you think, oh, well, I'm can't believe he would write this woman this way. If you really look into it, you're like, well, I think it's just by design. He's doing it this way on purpose. And yeah. let's be honest, guys, male writers were not writing female characters like this in the 1960s in sci-fi mm -hmm. or fantasy. So I, that's why I say it's a very, very progressive story. But as, as far as what Joanna said about she feels like she kind of, her role gets weakened by the end. I think because when you get to book three within this book, I think that's when it really starts to become about the next generation. It starts to become about Paul mm -hmm. and, of course, what she produced with Aaliyah. And I think that those really are kind of your main characters. So that's why it might kind of feel like that. But you think about that last line when a lot of people have a problem with the ending, you know, history will call us wives. But I don't really understand. Big thing with Frank is about how history is going to be recorded. It doesn't matter what's happening right now. It's how are people going to look at this 20, 50, 100 years from now? And there's a line that Paul has in the book where he says, like, that big battle, I didn't even draw my blade. But in history, will tell us that I slayed like 20 people, 20 Sardaukar by myself. And it's kind of like this way it is. Yeah, we might be concubines, but in history, they're going to look at, they're going to know that we were basically queens, you know? So I, I never had a problem with that last line of the book, but I can, as a guy, I can take a step back and be like, okay, this might be different for a woman reading this, but I've always thought Jessica was like the first lady of sci-fi for me. I've always thought she was the best. And I don't know how much of that is because I know what happens in the sequels, but I can still see plenty of it in this book for sure. I appreciate and is Mike that. Mike the only Thank person you. who's read the sequels? I haven't. I haven't read them. No. Okay. You have the knowledge. I'll have to make sure I get it. Don't, don't talk past what happens in this book then. Um, I, I also really like Lady Jessica. I, I did think that there was a lot of impactful moments as a mother, um, some that have happened, some that I am looking forward to happening and some that I'm afraid to have happen in terms of, you know, the arc between her and Paul, because this really is the coming of age story to end all coming of age stories, which I assume is one of the reasons why you really love it, Mike, because Absolutely. it has the coming of age with the galaxy, the, the weight of the universe on your shoulders. That's, that's, that's some high stakes. Definitely. And I think one of the things I really liked, cause you guys have touched on all of the other points about Lady Jessica. And I just agree with all of the things that you have said, but one of the things that made me feel really connected to her in this story is I feel like a lot of the tension is centered around Lady Jessica because hmm. we're given, and this is a, a writing of, or a plot device that Stephen King, uses a lot as well, where he gives you a piece of information and you know that it's going to happen. It's a bad thing that's going to happen. It was the last time they ever saw them alive. Right. Yeah, that. <laughs> right? Yeah. But you can still create tension with that because you can make people so invested in how that unfolds that they're still really interested. You know, they don't close the book and say, well, you know, okay, well, Duke Leto is going to die. So, you know, this 400 pages of the book is not for me, I guess, because I already know this is going
going to happen. And I think that Frank Herbert builds up a lot of that tension around Lady Jessica because we get her as the main suspect from the point of view of characters who are really important to her family. And at least for me, I liked her so much and I liked the other characters so much that I didn't want them to think badly of her. And I wanted them to be able to figure out what this scheme was all about. I felt so tense. I was like, you need to know that she didn't do that. She loved him. This is, you know, this was not her plot. And I felt like that made me feel more connected to her character because I was really invested in how that was going to play out and how she was going to be received and how she was going to be remembered through history. And I that that made me feel closer to her as a character. And because of some of the things that you mentioned, Philip, in the in the spoiler free part, because of some of the narrative techniques and because this is such an expansive story, there are some characters who only exist off screen um, whose fate did probably not move me as much as it would have if they were characters who were on the page. But I was very invested in Jessica's fate. One of the most emotional scenes for me was when um, her friend, oh gosh, it's not Hallett with the other guy. Um, I wrote down people's names so I could remember them. Halleck, there we go. Gurney Halleck. Mm -hmm. When he comes back and he's initially suspicious of her and then they have their resolution and they come together and they're both able to grieve for Duke Leto at the same time. That's mm -hmm. the only part of the book that made me cry. And I thought that it was so well done because they were such great characters and they had been through so much and had to compartmentalize all of that. They couldn't waste the water, you know, they couldn't waste the, the energy to grieve properly. And when they came together as friends and were able to do that, I thought that that was such a, such a good moment. And it was a little bit removed from Paul's main story, but it was really impactful for me. And I think that's because I liked Jessica so much. Uh, I was, I was wasting, <laughs> I was wasting water in that scene too. <laughs> Yeah, I want to waste water right now just remembering it because it's right. such a beautiful scene for sure. Um, and I love what you said too, because I think like with the epigraphs and with everything, I, I totally agree with you that you could still get invested in the story and the way it's written. It really leads you to still care and invest in the characters. It did for me too. I know that, that um, I've heard some people say that they maybe didn't feel that way, that they they're like, why are you telling me this in the epigraph? I'm like, but it's, I think it's perfect. I thought the epigraphs were so, they were so fascinating for me. Like not only how they foreshadowed things, but also just gave you insights into the philosophy and to the ways of thinking, everything, the sociology, everything. So yeah, they're kind of like the Malazan epigraphs, except they make sense. <laughs> you know, it's so interesting because you could look at those epigraphs and say, why, why? Okay, so we know Paul's not going to die at any point in the book because the epigraphs tell us that, basically. We know lots of things that, you know, we, you would think, oh, that spoils, you know, I, but the epigraphs are, I think, a good indication of how they're, they're not about the plot, the things that happen. What, what the epigraphs, I think, are feeding into is the fact that this is as much about what's happening in here, what's happening in the internal development of the reader, um, as well as the, the characters in the story. So yeah, we know Paul's not gonna die, but I'm so interested in psychologically what this, this scene is gonna happen, what, what the impact is gonna be on him. So and, and in that sense, the epigraphs actually increase, for, for me, they actually increase the tension. Um, so I really like that. I think that they're a marvelous tool. So yeah, on a superficial level, they're kind of like spoilers, but on a deeper level, they make it a much richer book. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that they did that for me too. They absolutely increased the tension, especially when like foreshadowing things of like the interception between politics and religion and um, the ecology, everything. So yeah, I, I totally agree with that. Um, yeah. Is there anything that anybody... Sarah and I being Stephen King readers that he will flat out tell you, like, for example, Pet <laughs> Cemetery, he flat out tells you this person's going to die. You know what? You don't just put the book down. You're like, well, maybe there's a way they can stop it kind of thing like that. Or I hate if people will watch the movie that haven't read the book of Dune. They're like, that was a little too obvious to me that Yui was the traitor. I'm like, well, Frank tells you in chapter two that Yui is the traitor. <laughs> yeah. and he tells yeah. you yeah. that it's not long yeah. for this world. And you don't stop reading. You know, it's like that. What I always say about Stephen King, it's like, you know, the bad thing's coming. 
you just have to like be like train wreck in slow motion like it's coming what's ah yeah yeah i think that's a great storytelling technique even though it does annoy me that king does it so much but you know it's <laughs> one of the things i've learned to live with <laughs> well you know and i mean it reflects back so much of our own world and mm -hmm. things that we can relate to i mean that's the beauty of themes but especially in this book i mean there's a reason you can read this book 13 times know what's going to happen and it still impacts you it still hits you yep yeah, that's a great that example. Sense of, Mike. Oh, sorry, Philip. Go ahead. Oh, no. Oh, sorry. I, yeah, it's a little awkward. But yeah, I was just going to say, Mike, that's a great example of Yua because we're told in an epigraph early on that he's the traitor. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we know that. So if I hadn't known that he was a traitor, I wouldn't be focusing so much on him. But now that I know he's the traitor, I'm looking at every little move he does, and I'm like that. That everything he does is filled with tension for me. And there are still things to discover about him, like why he's the traitor. How and he broke his imperial coding, all that stuff, yeah. Exactly. All that gets more interesting as a result of having that information. So that's a great example. Sorry, Sarah. No, no, no. I, I was just going to build on that same thing. It's just, it, it really connects well. It's a good parallel to Paul's own internal struggle with this destiny that he feels he has this sense. I think he calls it his terrible purpose. And that's kind of what you feel when you're reading that there is this sense of foreboding that just permeates the story. And despite the information in the epigraphs or perhaps because of the information in the epigraphs, it just makes you want to keep going. Because like you said, you, you want to know how these prophecies are fulfilled you might know who the major players are but you you don't know what is going to unfold and it allows you like you said to focus on those smaller details and i think that that's really important especially when you're reading a book that has this scope because with with this stage and these many people and this level of importance you can't focus on what everybody is doing at all times so having some of that information helps you hone in on those more important players in the game i guess yeah as far as getting something different every time you read it like i think of when i read Dune the first time and paul's going through the gum jabbar i'm like jessica leave him alone let the boy focus quit trying to mom him the whole time you helicopter parent and now i'm reading and he's like with the fremen and he's like ah, i got this i'm like hey you need to listen to your mother damn it you know so i mean <laughs> that's how i'm like now i'm like listen to your parents kid you know so yeah you get different things at different stages in life i think yeah yep. It's interesting too. I know Philip and um, you and AP are we're just doing that archetype uh, series on your channels, and it was interesting to think about that while reading Dune and thinking of Paul too. Uh, like because Paul starts off, he's a young boy, and uh, it just seems like looking at him through everyone's perspective, including Leto's, Jessica's gurneys everyone's it's like they dunk in idaho they don't want him to they almost want to protect him they almost don't want him to grow and he's the only one kind of thinking i have this terrible purpose but uh he there's all everybody just kind of wants him to stay the safe seed and they know that he's going to have to grow up really fast and their one boy moment i i just love that uh the scene or the chapter where he wakes or he pretends he's asleep but he's gonna get up and sneak out. And I thought, remember, I remember reading that both the first time and this time thinking, oh, that's such a young boy thing to do, right? <laughs> Pretend I'm asleep, fake out mom, and then go sneak around. But he doesn't even get to have that innocent little boy or mischievous moment as a young boy. He finds out, you know, he's about to get, he, somebody's trying to kill him and he has to grow up so fast. He has to grow up so fast. And everyone knows that around him too. And it's kind of heartbreaking to see him have to transform as quickly as he does before he can even really catch up with it. Uh, even when he, you know, just kind of jumping ahead, not being able to grieve for his father, being able to suddenly see things all at once. I just, I found that really just powerful about his whole entire arc. And then at the end, I guess he makes some decisions that, I think are different than his dad would have made. <laughs> um, but it, it was just, you could tell too, at the same time that he learned so much from his father too. That was what I picked up anyway. Yeah. And I think that's the traditional fantasy part of it. If like you, your childhood can end boom. And one night you got to be responsible and be leading people now. And that's what book two basically starts. And in, in this with, with, with Paul. Yeah, a good indication of Paul's development 
from child to adult is, is how he succeeds in transcending his circumstances. And what I mean particularly is he gets another fa father figure, I think, in Stilgar, uh, the, the Fremen. And there's a point where the younger Fremen are wanting him to challenge Stilgar mm -hmm. in order to kill him and, and take over. And if Paul had not taken uh, transcended his circumstances, he would have been pushed into doing that, perhaps. But he did not want to lose another father figure. And so rather than being helpless when like he was when his first father died and, and being too young to do much about it, he's, he's matured to the point where he is able to transcend his circumstances and avert such an event. He's able to save Stilgar and, and, and even convince the others, no, I, I'm going to be the Duke and he's going to be my, my aide. He's going to be my helper. He's still going to be, you know, what he is right now in charge of the, the Fremen, but he's going to serve me better alive. You wouldn't, you wouldn't want me to cut my arm off and, and leave it on the floor bloody here. And that's what he is for me. He's my arm. So I, I really admire that point of maturity and, and how Paul is able to change things around him rather than succumb to things. And that's definitely a big coming of age thing for sure. Yeah, just the way he adapted too to the Fremen and their ways and still yeah. kind of walked his path at the same time. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting too. Would you say he could be many places at once? Is that what you were saying? <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. All right. laughs> I'm assuming that's going to tie in more. I don't, I don't know that much about the books to come except for like some vague hints that people have dropped when I've been talking about Dune. But I'm assuming his integration into the Fremen and how he is both of them and not of them is going to become important in future volumes when we start to explore what it means to be a leader and what it means to stand on your own and how how you can't ever really belong fully to anyone and we see that separation between paul in so many ways in his life between him and his sister him and his mother him and the fremen him and his um his children or his child like all of these characters he is able to relate to them and care about them but not ever fully feel like he is with them and i do wonder if that is going to be explored a little bit more in future volumes. I feel like me and you listen to, to, to Philip and Chaz talk about the Dark Tower in that one video we did right now. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> yeah. Just know that the, the, the sequels are greatly divisive. Mm. That's all I'll say, greatly divisive, because Frank had such a big hit with this, he could have just kind of written the same thing again, but didn't. He did something very, very different, and a lot of people had a hard time adjusting to that. So that's I'll kind of leave it there. Hmm. Mm. Another point I wanted to talk about briefly is I mentioned earlier how modern fantasy sci-fi genre fiction tends to be more visceral, mm -hmm. um, but this not is not without its losses, and I think that that is a very important point as well. We we lose some really beautiful characters along the way, uh, some really hard hitting moments, you know, like Duncan Idaho, for example. Um, I, I was just kind of like, no, you can't kill Duncan, you know? <laughs> and we were like, why does the fandom love Duncan Idaho so much? I'm like, just keep reading. <laughs> yeah. Duncan is wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, he's wonderful. And, and um, you know, of course, Duke Leto yeah. and then his namesake, uh, yeah. Leto II. That, that is just heartbreaking that... And here's a character I never even actually met. I don't think little Leto ever appears well, I mean, but, you're human. You see little babies getting killed. You're kind of like, you're going to feel yeah. something, I think, right? <laughs> yeah, but it broke my heart because of the effect that it had on both Paul and Chani, I think. Um, the effect that it had on them and their relationship, because it's interesting, because his removal makes Chani, I think, not ever waver in her dedication to, to Paul, but there is that sense in which she's no longer relevant because it's obvious he's going to have to marry this princess, uh, Irulan, and then um, she's she's going to be put by the wayside. But no, 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 she's not. And there's that beautiful moment at the end. Um, but yeah, the, so they're, they're just, there's some tough, tough losses in here too that that make the whole thing, I think, more compelling um, as well. And you, and you I think even feel something for Yui a little bit when the way he goes out. Absolutely. What, what was really going on. Yeah, for sure. Yep. And yep. I think he did the right thing in the end, you know, so, I mean, sort of, you know, <laughs> sort of. He tried. 
by putting the the uh, the capsule in, in the Duke's tooth you know? and make making sure that the uh, Paul and Jessica had stuff. Paul and yeah. Jessica, yeah, mm -hmm. and he saved them. He he did risk something um, in in saving them too because he could have exposed himself sooner than he needed uh, would have wanted by by saving them. So yeah, he he didn't need to do that. So yeah, yeah. And speaking of Irulan, it is, you do feel for her at the end as well, because you get these epigraphs that you know are written by her. And yeah. then it's kind of like a, a little punch at the end when he's like, you know, she will be part of my life, but she will be recording our story. And she has literally been recording their story this whole time. And you just didn't know what the impact of that is. Two. Very big part in book two. That is, is such a, a good point, Sarah. That's something I, I don't think gets mentioned a lot is that yeah, you, you care sad, about sad, her sad, in a sense. I felt like I cared about her too because it's yeah. like you're following her along. You're excited to meet her. Oh, there she is. And then he's basically saying, yeah, she <laughs> she will only be my wife. Your empress in, in name only. Name only, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it seems like the, the Bene Gesserit are used to these kinds of things. There's the, there's the couple, the Count, uh, what's his name? Fenring. Fenring. Yeah, Fenring. And his wife, uh, who is a um, also a, um, a Bene Gesserit, when they're talking about how she's going to seduce young uh, Fade, Fade Routha, is that yeah. the name? Yeah. And how, you know, they just see things in such a utilitarian way. And, and it's like, she's going to use her body and she has no real emotional attachment to the fact that, mm -hmm. that she's going to, I don't, we didn't see this child being born, but I assume that maybe that's something that comes up later on. Yeah. Um, perhaps Mike knows, <laughs> <laughs> but, but the way that they are able to turn off their emotions is almost scary. Um, and, and the way they're able to manipulate others and, and use themselves in order to achieve this, this bigger goal, uh, whatever it might be. Um, it's, it's a bit scary. Um, and, and Paul has some of that too, of course, uh, being, uh, what he is, he has, uh, of course, visions of something much vaster than, than what's going on in front of what, what everybody else recognizes is going on. Um, and that can be kind of scary because then there are moments I think where even Gurney kind of looks at him and is like, who is this guy I'm following now? You know, and he's kind of like, who is this person who his father would have thought about the people first and then the equipment, but that's not what Paul's doing. Paul is thinking about like the whole universe, you know, yes. um, he's thinking about how to avoid the, uh, the jihad and, and all that. So yeah, he's trying to save lives in a much bigger way than Gurney's capable of even realizing. You talk about scary. I'm curious to think what you guys think about Aaliyah, because the idea of like a, a one-year-old walking around talking like a full-grown person with all this knowledge and, and using the voice and stuff, that would just absolutely terrify me. And I mean, I, oh, even yeah. the Reverend Mother's terrified of her. So it's, it's, yeah. it's an interesting character, and I think it has a really great start, but I, I just think that would be absolutely horrifying to witness in person. Can you imagine the emotional maturity of a child? You know how how wild those moods can be. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like um, the vampire children in you're an Anne Rice fan, like yeah. the, you know, it's it's the same kind of oh, yeah. idea, right? The it's it is a terrifying concept. And I also didn't know that this was a concept that Christopher Paolini had kind of lifted from Dune until I read Dune. Hmm. Huh. Well apparently he gets a lot of criticism for lifting a lot. But uh yeah, I don't know. I've only read two of those books. So mm -hmm. I, he put his own spin on it to be fair and you know you have everyone has their inspirations but I just didn't even know because when I had read he has a, a similar setup in in his books and when I had read them I was like that's really cool what an interesting a, thing to think of I got no problem with lifting you guys heard of Star Wars yeah guess what it lifted a lot from <laughs> a lot from yeah so I could make a video just on what Star Wars ripped off from Dune and I love Star Wars so yeah very influential yeah and of course, the litany of fear. Uh, everyone knows that. <laughs> yeah, ah, there, there we is. go. Yeah. Good stuff. I have a question for you, Mike. What are you excited to see in the adaptation? Like, is there something that you just really want to see on screen? Well, I already saw in the preview I got to see, I got to see the part where Leto rescues Leto and Paul and Journey rescue the workers as the as the you know the bless the maker and his water scene. You get to I got to see that part. That was definitely one of the ones I wanted to see for sure. 
Uh, for me, it's got to be Paul riding the riding the worm. It's got to be what I want to see, and that's we're not going to see that unless we get a part two. I know. Uh, so I, I'm most anxious for that. I also kind of really curious to see how they do the weirding way because if you've seen the '84 ridiculous thing they did in that, made it like voice modulators. It was just so dumb. Uh, I, I realized that they needed some kind of fit. I, I just I'm interested to see what they do because the way that Denny V has done the voice in the movie, I think, will be very interesting for some people to see the way that he does it. It isn't just the scary voice like they use in the original movie it's something very different so i am very curious to see how he does the weirding way it makes it seem like it's different kind of fighting style than even the fremen who are like badass fighters already that they're just like completely blown away by and jessica's able to get the upper hand on them with it so uh, i'm most interested in that and of course like the, the right in the sandworms has got to be it i mean that's that's everything you know such a big moment it's such a good scene and too. the water of life scene will probably be pretty trippy too i hope it goes really really trippy mm-hmm yeah so okay. basically everything <laughs> <laughs> are you guys planning to see the movie as well the adaptation philip and joanna definitely yeah. definitely yeah uh, see it in imax if you can if you if you feel like risking it please go see it in imax because trust me it's going to be like lord of the rings and that thing that like you remember seeing it on the screen because it's just so impressive mm -hmm. oh. definitely i haven't watched a full trailer i think i only watched the because there are two trailers, right? There's like a brief trailer and then a longer one. I only saw the brief one, so. There's like the trailer and then there's like the story trailer. The second one actually tells you what the story's about. The first one's just like, hey, look how epic this is. Right, yeah. yeah. Just like the buzzworthy one. I waited until after I had finished reading to watch the longer trailer. Because I had asked um, Andrew, who had read Dune, if it was spoilery. And he said, there's probably things that you'll see in the longer trailer that you don't want to know yet so i, I try not to do that because i feel like it'll influence me about what i see when i'm reading it that's why i always will be like i always will choose to read the book before to see the adaptation because i don't want what i see on the screen even as far as like the actors and the action scene stuff it influencing what i what i like that's why i read every stephen king book before i'll see a movie and, and then i'm usually just disappointed with the movie but you know yeah. uh yeah definitely always do it that way yeah i wonder how the movie is going to do all these elements because i mean that's something that i've been saying uh frequently lately is that the, something about the book uh, is that i as much as i love this book it leaves me wanting more like mm -hmm. when i finish the book I, I feel like i have to go on in this series i don't feel like i could just stop here even though i know that dune can be considered a standalone um yeah. yeah i mean i know that you said that it's very divisive what the thought i think it's because uh the, the sequels like you get more stuff about like the butlerian jihad and things like that and different things that Leah and 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 uh and Irulan do and it's just it's Without saying too much, I think people want a more Paul, and you don't get as much of Paul as you would think that you would get because of his book. So I basically will say is that I don't feel like Paul is the main character of the series of the Dune Chronicles as a whole, and that's kind of tough for some people to process. They wanted more Paul, so I'll, oh, I'll leave it there. Okay, yeah. So that's why it gets kind of divisive. If you just love the universe, you're going to have a blast with it. I do love the universe. I do. I, yeah, <laughs> I love the and universe. And I know you You said you wanted more, Joanna, which I think is, you know, when a book is this good, it's hard not to want more of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but how did you feel about the ending itself? We had a lot of discussion on Discord about the ending of Dune and what happened, how it ended up being this kind of smaller scale individual battle that looped back to that initial conflict rather than a grand scheme, like space battle with all of the weapons that have been uncovered and and everything how did you feel about that did you like that think that it was fitting or were you looking for something more epic are you asking me personally or yeah or all, all of you but you personally oh, yeah. you, were, oh. <laughs> you haven't been talking as much because you've been asking us questions yeah to me it seemed like it was almost like a arthurian legend kind of thing you know a trial by combat uh, it's basically is like hey or even you go back to like greek mythology of like achilles and things like that where they would have the armies okay let's do you want to just have like a one-on-one -on -one to solve this or do we want to let a hundred thousand people die in this battle that i'm probably going to win anyway kind of thing so i like that i like that a lot it saved a lot of lives doing it that way even if paula died you know yeah i like the cyclicality of the ending because you do have a lot of nods back to the beginning where Paul encounters the the Reverend Mother, the one that gave him the Gom Jabbar in, in the beginning, and and they go back to the same 
home where they had started, uh, where they had tried to make a home and they're in that same building. And so there's a lot of just sort of like that feeling of you've come back full circle now. And of course, Paul is a very different person and that's the point, right? That he's gone on this journey and he's matured. And so I love the ending. I thought it was uh, really well done. And there is a battle of a sort that happens. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of off page because you get a lot of it being reported and i i felt a lot of tension actually and watching the, the trailer that. you're going to get to see it on the screen though <laughs> yeah i'm sure they'll put it on the screen of mm -hmm. the film that, that's going to be if there's are they going to make three parts out of the the, the movie he or? wants to make three and he wants okay. to do dune and do messiah he wants to okay. stop there he wants to make three so two parts for dune and one for messiah which i thought oh, was kind okay. of crazy but okay. now i see i said okay if you're doing your coming of age thing of just paul i can see him doing it that way for sure mm -hmm. huh cool Wow. I am not one who needs like a big epic battle at the end. Yeah. There are several books that I've loved dearly that don't do that. <laughs> that seem less popular because of that. But I, but I, I did feel somewhat like, I just felt like it wasn't over for me. Like it, it needed to go on. Um, I encourage and you to. I didn't go on the first time because I was very strongly discouraged from doing so somebody I was very close to when I read it nine years ago, he just swore that I would be disappointed that it's nothing. I did hear it was very different, mm -hmm. but I do think that I love the world enough that I might enjoy future books in the series. Now, how I can fit them in, I don't know <laughs> at this point, um, but I, I do, I did feel that way because I mean, even just reading the appendices information about the ecology of Dune and the religion of Dune, and all of those things were fascinating for me. So I think I'm actually a bigger world building fan than ever, I, than I've ever been before in my reading life. So I can see myself being interested in future books possibly. And I, I think that- about the, the future books is don't read just Doom Messiah as the sequel to Dune or you'll be disappointed. I tell people mm. read Doom Messiah and Children of Dune together because Doom Messiah is very short. It's very to the point it really almost feels like a setup for what Children of Doom was. And I say, if you're happy with the story there, stop. But knowing the Malazan fans that you two are, God <laughs> Emperor Dune is absolutely the most philosophical book I've ever read in my life. And I can say, I bet Dune, Malazan fans will love God Emperor Dune, even if a lot, because a lot of modern audiences, they aren't going to be able to process some stuff that's in God Emperor Dune. But you being big into the philosophy, especially you, Philip, I think that you will, uh, you will love God Emperor Dune. So I will definitely encourage you to keep going after that and you see i i love philosophical elements i don't even own a hard copy of dune right now i read it on ebook but on ebook i was like highlighting every single little philosophical <laughs> thing in like a certain color and that kind of thing um so i think that those things obviously appeal to me i know Brittany from books with Brittany is reading on in the series and she loves it she says it's her favorite series of all time and <laughs> even more than Malazan or anything. So, and she told me that you get much more deeply into the philosophy and religion in future oh, yeah. books. So oh, yeah. that would seem pretty promising to me. Speaking of stuff that Philip loves, um, could <laughs> you please tell me if you know about the language? Because I noticed when I was reading this that a lot of the, um, what's, uh, you know, in the stuff in italics, the, 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 the Fremen language or whatever these languages are, there's a couple of different ones, I guess. But I noticed that a lot of it has sort of an Arabic flavor yeah, to it. But I also, yeah. also noticed because uh, I do speak Nepali, I noticed that some of it also is very South Asian. Like I could translate some of the stuff in here, like just knowing a South Asian, you know, a Sanskrit derived language. Like there's a part so now, where- These are the parts where I just admit that your brain is much, much bigger than mine. So yeah, I knew about <laughs> the Arabic influence, but I never knew about this part. For sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. Like uh, there's, I don't know, it's page 287 for me, but- it's Chani's whispering something, Dui Yanka Hin Mange, Dui Punra Hin Mange. It's a little different, but uh, Dui Anka is two eyes, and it's exactly the same in Nepali. It's Dui Anka, uh, you know, and uh, Dui Punra is close enough to uh, two feet. I mean, so I was just wondering how much you knew about what he was doing with the language stuff and, and uh, kitab, kitab, whatever, kitab means book in, in uh, Nepali as well and in Hindi. And I think uh, it might come from It makes sense that that's what he would be doing. Is, but that is, huh. as far as linguistics, like I said, unless it's like Tolkien and Elvish and stuff, I'm not really getting in much into the linguistic side of it. Like you are like, I mean, when I first read, I'm like, Lisan Al-Gai, what in the hell is that? Shai Halud, what is going on here? You know, but 
yeah. I just kind of accepted them as, you know, just in universe words. And I kind of learned later about like the, the Arabic influence, but okay. You know, about well, there's, now. there's the, obviously there's, there's the desert setting as well. So the, the, the Arabic and South Asian flavor of it all makes sense. If that's what he's trying to convey, I guess. Um, but I, I, I just thought it was cool. And I love languages in, in not only fantasy, obviously, but in science fiction. I can do there. about 500 words in Spanish. That's about as far as I go outside of English. So <laughs> that'll, that'll, that'll get you to a toilet or whatever you need. Right? <laughs> sure. That's better. Well, my than wife speaks perfect Spanish. She's my C3. Oh, I'm good. Well, then you better keep her around too, then. So yeah. I grew up in a bilingual household and I, I don't know any Spanish. So <laughs> <laughs> it's been the worst. I have like a serious block when it comes to languages. I, I really do. Um, yeah. Any last thoughts? Because I think we're about at an hour now. And does anybody have any last Just thoughts? Just that I'm extremely excited that you guys liked it. And it seems like you guys liked it enough to keep going in the series. I'm, I'm excited about that. I've, a lot of people just trash the sequels. And I understand where they're coming from. I do. But to me, it's like if you go into it with your expectations checked, that you're not getting this again. You're not getting that. It's by far my favorite. I mean, and it can very much be a standalone, but I said, if you love the universe, I think you're going to be fine if you accept that it. it's not just about Paul. It's not just going to be Paul's journey. It really isn't. You, you really get a lot about uh, Aaliyah for sure, and you get a lot about Paul's kids and stuff in this series. So it's lots of stuff. I mean, Paul's kids are very, very big in, in this series. So uh, go into it with those expectations, and uh, maybe you might see some faces reappear that you did not expect to reappear that become very, very, very pivotal to the series as you go forward. But as far as Dune 5 and 6, maybe I've just kind of always kind of looked down on those because he did he, he passed away before he finished, and I think what his kid has done has just been absolutely blasphemy. So, uh, yeah, uh, I, I would say my recommendation, read the trilogy if you just want, like, uh, the, the, the full coming-of-age story, and read God Emperor of Dune if you're not allergic to highly philosophical books. Yeah. Do you That's think number there's four? a... God Emperor is number four? Mm -hmm. God Emperor's Force is it's a Dune, Dune Messiah, Children of Dune, then God Emperor of Dune. And right. of course, it's up to you with Chapter House or Heretics if you if you want to keep going. Got it. Is there a favorite message from Dune that you take away with you, Mike? I mean, fear is the mind killer. Is the obvious, yeah. one, right? But uh, I, I think a, a lot of things, and, and I, I've kind of talked about it's a sensitive topic, so I try to do it too much, but uh, uh, you get a lot of times you get people to give you ac accusations about what your political beliefs are, and I'm like, look, I cut my teeth on this series as far as my political views and Frank's big message in these books is that we, you shouldn't trust leaders ever, uh, especially not blindly. And so that's always just something I've kind of taken to heart myself to where, uh, yeah, you might seem great on paper, but uh, something up here is telling me there's something doesn't quite pass the eye test. And I think that's a big message, obviously, but, but obviously yes, fear is the big one. I mean, overcoming that helped me find my confidence and stuff. stuff. I was the same age as Paul, you know, when this book really clicked for me. So from that first moment, that was just a mantra that I adapted to my real life. And I, I still really do. I mean, I talked to my kid when he was scared to, to meet his new baseball team or whatever. And I was like, oh, fear's a brown killer, bro. Come on. You know, it's just stuff that I, 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 people may find it silly or hokey or cheesy, but to me, it's very, very important. And it's something that'll always stick with me. No, absolutely. It's beautiful. Yeah. 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 What about you, Sarah and Philip? Any sort of larger theme or message from Dune that you are taking away with you from this read through? Um, I think the, the things that resonated with me the most were probably the elements that are related to parenthood, because that's, that's really what most of my life is, you know, subsumed by right now. Most of what I do, I can relate back to parenthood in one way or another, but I also, we didn't, we didn't talk about it a lot, but I, I do like the environmental themes that are touched on in Dune. I think that's such a huge part of the world building. And I think that as with many things, Frank Herbert was, far ahead of his time in terms of the exploration that he did with Dune. And so I think that that, that element of interconnectedness and that importance in how if we disrupt one part of that flow or one part of that chain of life as a whole, as opposed to just life for us as humans, it can be devastating. So I think that, that that's a really important part to take away from Dune. But I think there's so much. It's hard to it's hard to take yeah. one thing away from it. It's going to be a fun book to reread and to rediscover over time. Absolutely beautiful. What about you, Philip? Yeah, well, I, I think definitely what Sarah said uh, for, about the ecological aspects of it, and I think we as a species need to transcend our tribalism 
<laughs> and that's a very important thing for me. And I think that's something that you see and hear as a theme and realize our connection to not only each other, but to the world around us. Uh, it's just so, so important. Um, and, and along those lines, I'd like to thank you, Joanna, for, for having the three of us here. Uh, you three are some of my favorite people I've, I've gotten to meet on, on BookTube. So it's just, it's just a pleasure and an honor really to be here with you guys and talk about books and, and feel that sense of connection with uh, people I like. So thank you very much. He's a sweetheart. He's the best. <laughs> I know. I'm you ever really feel down? Just talk to Philip. He'll make you feel like a million bucks. He's great. I know. <laughs> it's so true. It's so true. Um, I feel the same way about you three, of course. And this was so special for me. This is such a beautiful book with such a powerful message on so many levels, so many questions and themes re related to what makes us human and the future and thinking beyond just our limited self. I, I think that's what really resonated for me about this book. So I really love Philip's use of the word connection as he described throughout this talk. And also just about uh, the dangers of living in a sort of paradise, which I think we kind of live in, you know, if we look around, we have a lot of modern conveniences mm -hmm. and it's very easy, I think, like it says in one of the epigraphs to become maybe a little, you know, to, to kind of lose touch with certain things, lose touch with um, what's important sometimes. And so I think this book really gets me to focus on what's important in life. And I love a book like that. So I think like Sarah, this is a book that I will reread and take away different messages every time I reread it. And I'm not surprised, Mike, that this is your favorite book of all time. I am so, so honored to have you three here. Um, Philip, I am always so honored to have you on my channel. You speak so beautifully and it, you're so eloquent and it's always uh, just wonderful to hear your thoughts and insights. And Mike, I am so honored to have you here to discuss your 13th read through of your favorite book and to be on my channel. It's just such an honor and Sarah, what an honor to have you on my channel. I consider you, of course, a good friend and to have read through and heard your insights, were, they were just fantastic. Uh, I also am impressed that this was your first read through of the book and that you took away as much as you did. So <laughs> I'm very impressed with all three of you. Thank you all so, so much. And thank you all so much for watching. Bye-bye. <laughs>